All right, I think we'll get going. Thanks to those who've joined. Um, my name is Calvin. I'm a second year medical student at Tufts. Today, I'm going to be talking about or talking through a case from the Brigham and Women's Hospital and the New England Journal of Medicine. So this is a case that was posted in the Journal of Medicine um, for educational purposes. And I'm going to today go through it with you all. Okay. So just a quick outline of, the, of what we're going to be doing in the talk today. So I'll start with how the patient presented in the office. Um, and then we'll take a look at his physical exam, his neurological exam, which is, which is, um, which is very detailed and relevant um, for this particular case, because his chief complaint, um, as you'll see, is a neurological one. So we'll go through all these components of the neuro exam. We'll take a look at some lab results that we got back from him. Um, he got some imaging done, some CTs and some chest x-rays. We'll see why we got those eventually. Some histopathological findings from biopsy, we'll take a look. Um, we'll then take a look at how, the, how we uh, managed the patient or how this group of doctors managed the patient and then what the final outcome of this, of this um, man was. And then I'll just sum up some of the teaching points um, that are relevant for this case. So here we go. We have a 64 year old man. He's a right handed man presenting with gait instability and visual changes and also some diffuse weakness. Two months earlier, he had noticed a sensation of flashing lights in his visual field. So right off the bat, we have primarily neurological deficits that this patient is, is coming in with. So on further questioning, we figured out that he has intermittent, so not persistent, but intermittent double vision and visual difficulties while driving. And he's missing turns because he failed to notice them. So already in your mind, you should be thinking about one side of the peripheral vision is, um, is not working quite right. That's the, that's the clue with this presentation. He's having some difficulty walking. He's unstable. And he described his limbs feeling like they weighed nine tons. His fine motor skills are impaired. For example, he mentioned that he had trouble putting stamps on an envelope for about a week. Um, he has the inability to perform simple arithmetic and balance his checkbook. And then in general, Previously simple tasks, such as us using his television remote, sort of coming back to these fine motor skills and perhaps simple arithmetic uh, with the numbers on the remote were suddenly confusing. A month ago, so this is what happened a month ago, a little bit further in the past, he's having worsening dyspnea with activity. So something lung or cardiovascular is going on too. He's had no change in a longstanding cough from COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And he's had no episodes of hemoptysis, which means blood in uh, coughing up blood or wheezing. He's had frequent early morning headaches, which he describes as generalized, diffuse and throbbing. So not a band, not the periorbital one. Um, and it's transiently relieved, not completely, but transiently temporarily relieved with um, over the counter analgesics. I think he mentioned ibuprofen and aspirin. His partner, his wife noticed uncharacteristic anger and irritability. Um, so a, a, a personality change as well happening with this patient about a month ago. Okay, the patient's history, the further questioning. Like I said, he has some COPD, he has some obstructive sleep apnea, daytime sleepiness. His metabolic History is relevant for hyperlipidemia and impaired fasting glucose, although no official diagnosis of um, diabetes type two. And as far as the head, eyes, ears, nose, and throat, he has some cataracts. The medications, um, baby aspirin, torvastatin is a cholesterol, torvastatin is a cholesterol reducing agent, theophylline, inhaled tiotropium, and inhaled fluticasone and salmeterol for probably for the COPD. Social history, he does have a 60 pack year cigarette um, smoking history. He did quit three years ago. He, has, uh, he drinks alcohol rarely, no illicit drugs, no recent travel outside his home state. 
he worked, he once worked as an underground pipe layer. So there is some environmental exposure there um, that we can think about later. But he has been retired for several years. He's in the monogamous with a female partner. No, uh, hmm? no. um, and he has a negative, he had a negative HIV test one year ago. On physical exam, so taking a look um, at his physical, his vital signs are pretty much normal, slightly low, SA, uh, this O2 sat, um, but otherwise his respiratory rate is normal. The heart rate is 74 and regular. The blood pressure is mildly elevated, but not, nothing alarming. He's awake, alert, and oriented person, time and place. He's seated upright in bed and he's in no acute distress. Taking a look at his lungs, chest, and heart, he said no tenderness, he has no tenderness to palpation of the chest wall or the back, no accessory muscles to breathe, so he's breathing just fine. Both of his lungs are clear to auscultation uh, with the stethoscope and there's no dullness to percussion. However, there are some expiratory wheezes in both lungs. So the end of expiration, there's some wheezing. There are normal, as on the cardiac exam, there are normal S1 and S2 sounds, regular rate and rhythm, RRR, and there is no jugular venous distension apparent up, up in his neck. So no right heart congestion um, is, the reason, is the reason there. For the abdomen, it's soft, no relevant findings here, non-distended, non-distender, non-tender. Vowel sounds are audible throughout normal, and there's no hepatosplenomegaly. The legs. Normal pulses, normal dorsalis pedis in both uh, pulse in both legs. There is, however, one plus pitting edema um, extending just above both ankles. No tenderness, normal distal pulses, um, and normal muscle strength. As far as the skin, musculoskeletal system, and the lymph nodes, is warm, dry skin, no rashes, no joint swelling. There is no cervical or axillary lymphadenopathy, but but there is an enlarged right inguinal lymph node, one centimeter, which is soft and non-tender. So the inguinal, the right, that would be this side, the right inguinal lymph node, he has one right in, in, inguinal lymph node that is um, one centimeter soft and non-tender, but it is enlarged. Okay, now, so this patient came in with primarily, uh, his primary complaint remember was the flashing lights in the visual field, gait instability, weakness. Um, he has, these are neurological complaints. So it's necessary that we do a complete uh, neurological exam. We'll start with the mental status. His arousal, he's alert, he's appropriately interactive, no slowing, uh, preservation or disinhib disinhibition of response. As far as orientation, he's appropriately oriented to person, time, and place, like I said before. However, with attention, he spells the word world correctly, forward, but as D-L-O-R-O-R, -O -R, backward. And he does list days of the week out of order as Sunday, Saturday, Tuesday, Monday. So here we can appreciate some, uh, some attention deficits in his presentation. More on the mental status with language. He makes no paraphrasic errors, but on rare occasions, the, the speech is slurred with some stuttering. He speaks in a normal volume with prosody, and he follows one step and two step commands without confusing the left and right side. So there's no left right confusion. His affect and mood is um, normal, pleasant, cooperative, appropriate, no restlessness, no agitation and his mood matches the, his affect, and his thought process is also intact. He's goal-oriented with no loose associations, and he has the capacity for abstract thought that is grossly intact. And there are specific ways to test all of these things. I'm not gonna go through them now. Cranial nerves. So this might bring back some uh, feelings from our recent uh, neuro, uh, neuro exam, but it is important that we go through each and every single one of our cranial nerves to make sure there's no brain stem lesions, or if there are, we can, we can pinpoint where they are. So cranial nerve one, the olfactory nerve, we test by 
bringing some coffee grounds under their nose, who's an intact sense of smell, cranial, cranial nerve to the optic nerve. The pupils are round and symmetric, measuring three millimeters in diameter. However, there is a profound left homonymous hemianopia. So that means the entire half of his left visual field. So if you were to draw you know, a line in each of your visual fields vertically, right in the middle of each of each visual field of your eye, the entire left side is blank. And remember, he, had, he, was, he was missing turns while he was driving. So this would make sense of one half of his entire field of vision. The same on each side. The left half on each side is, is gone. On a picture test, so to, the patient's asked to look at a picture. The, he focuses on the right half of the picture, and he ignores completely the left side. And these findings are confirmed on visual field testing, where you bring your, you know, you bring your, uh, your fingers in and ask when the patient sees them. Uh, the oc the oculomotor nerves, the um, nerves that control eye movements, three, four, and six. His extraocular movements are intact. There's no diplopia. However, he has an inability to look fully to the left side, either with either voluntarily or with guidance. So now he has a problem looking laterally, moving his eyes, physically moving his eyes over to the left side, but he does not have any nystagmus or ptosis. Cranial nerve five, the trigeminal nerve, you test the three regions of the face. He has uh, intact light, light touch sensation for all branches of cranial nerve five. The facial nerve, cranial nerve seven, is no flattening of the nasal labial fold. Um, he can smile just fine, puff out his cheeks is fine, eyelid closure is good, and brow wrinkling is intact and symmetric. Cranial nerve eight, the oculocephalic nerve, or sorry, um, I forget what that one's called, sorry. The finger rub heard in both ears, um, with the sound slightly louder in the oculo vis I'm not going to try, something vestibulo with cranial nerve eight. It's slightly louder in the left ear than the right ear. Cranial nerves nine and 10, he has difficulty pronouncing Episcopalian. So these are the glossopharyngeal and vagus nerves that control our ability to speak and the, our pharynx, they control muscles of the pharynx and larynx. So he does have some deficit there. Cranial nerve 11 um, is the spinal accessory nerve. His shoulder shrug is symmetric and the head, head turns for the sternocleidomastoids are strong and symmetric. Now taking a look at his motor exam. He has increased girth and normal tone in muscle groups in the arms and legs. He has no tremor or bradykinesia and no asymmetry on finger tapping or arm orbiting and the strength is full strength throughout all muscle groups. He has no muscle weakness or any deficits in motor function. Sensory, light touch is intact throughout. As far as double simultaneous stimulation, he has no extinction, but the patient misreports his left leg as his left hand and names his right leg when his right hand is, is stimulated. So there is some um, confusion in that regard. Um, for stereognosis, he has intact, it's intact for use of a pen and a comb so he can feel these objects and determine what they are in his hand. Graphesthesia. And graphesthesia is the ability to recognize writing or drawing on the skin through the sensation of touch. So there is a severe impairment of, of this function on the left side of the body, an impairment with regard to complex constructions on the right side. The Romberg test is positive, so we have the patient stand up, put his arms in front of him and close his eyes, and he is unstable when he does that. Moving on to the reflexes, um, the bilateral reflexes, biceps, triceps, and brachioradialis in the arms are all normal. The legs, the quadriceps, the quadriceps reflex is difficult to elicit bilaterally. The gastroc reflex is absent bilaterally, and the Babinski downward, therefore normal in the right foot, but upward in the left. Um, the, uh, as far as coordination and gait, the finger nose 
finger nose finger test, which is out like this. Um, there is mild end action tremor. So at the sure. end, right as he's about to touch the clinician's hand, it's a little wobbly and tremorous. And there, there is some overshooting with both fingers, greater in the right finger than in the left. As far as his mirroring, his ability to mimic the action of turning a light bulb, that's rhythmically intact. The rapid alternating movements, we ask the patient to go like this. Um, both arms show mild dysdiadocokinesia, which is a deficit in the ability to rapidly flip around your wrist like that. On finger to nose testing, um, it's inaccurate on both sides with the eyes open or closed. On the right side, the patient touched the eye and then made a correction, but on the left, he touched the cheek without making a correction, and there is a mild and action tremor. His gait. His gait is broad-based and it's unsteady. He has the inability to walk in a straight line without assistance. Okay, the summary, we'll just go through this quickly. His mental status, his ability to pay attention is impaired. Remember, he couldn't recite the days of the week in order. He couldn't really spell things in reverse either. The cranial nerves are significant for a homonymous hemianopia on the left. Limited horizontal gaze, that is again to the left. His slurred speech, occasionally in difficulties with pronunciation. His motor function is normal. Normal strength, normal tone in the arms and legs. Sensory, there is altered double simul simultaneous stimulation, a lack of graphesthesia, but there is a positive, there is a swaying Romberg's, Romberg's test. Reflexes, difficult to elicit in the legs, and there is a Babinski present in the left foot. And as finally as coordination, there is an altered response on finger nose finger test and finger two nose test. Babinski, yeah. that's it, this knee, the oh, knee reflex. I know it is. Okay. The, uh, and then there are, finally, there is evidence of dystidocokinesia. Oh, one more thing. Gait is broad-based and unsteady. Okay, question one. Um, you can use the chat box or just think about the answer in your head. Um, the clinical findings, you have to remember for this question, the visual pathway. The clinical finding of complete left homonymous hemianopia is most suggestive of a lesion in which one of the following structures. There's only one of these choices can give you a left homonymous hemianopia. So is it an optic nerve lesion? Is it a chiasm lesion, frontal lobe, or occipital lobe? And then you need to figure out which side it's on. So I'll give you 10 seconds or so to think about this. Okay, the correct answer is the right occipital lobe. Um, and I've taken this, this diagram from first aid with a couple of my little annotations. And you'll notice that the blue, the blue is the left half of the visual field. And if you trace the blue along in each eye, going into this nasal part of the retina here and then the lateral part of the retina here, traveling, for this eye, the left eye, it crosses the optic chiasm, whereas over here on the right eye, the left visual field information remains on the right side um, past the optic chiasm. It does not cross the optic chiasm. So that the entire left side of the world is being viewed or is being processed by the right side of the brain. Thus, if we have a right occipital lobe lesion, right down here, this is where these fibers are ending up. All of these fibers here are being knocked out. And that'll give you, if you trace back, trace back to the blue line, you're gonna have an entire a homonymous, meaning it's both, both left-sided, and hemianopia means you can't see that part. So a left-sided homonymous hemianopia in both sides if you have a right occipital lesion. Okay, next question. The findings on neurologic exam included impairment 
of voluntary horizontal gaze, agraphesthesia, and dysdiadochokinesia, lesion of which three is most likely. So we need to trace back these um, neuro exam findings back to the structures in the brain um, that control that control these functions. So another 10 seconds. Okay, let's take a look. The correct answers are the cerebellum, the frontal lobe, and the parietal lobe. And the reason for this, the horizontal gaze, remember the patient couldn't look laterally to the left um, or to the, to the left side with either eye. And this is because, or this draws us back to the frontal eye fields, which are located in the prefrontal cortex. So that's why choice three of the frontal lobe is correct. Agraphesthesia is primarily mediated by the parietal lobe. Um, so that's why the parietal lobe is the correct answer. And then finally, dysdiadochokinesia, which is you know, the inability to rapidly move your movements or move your wrists rapidly. Um, and the altered coordination is unsteady gait. That is controlled by the cerebellum. Okay, let's go on to some lab results. These are largely unremarkable. Um, so all of these, I don't think I'll read through all of these, but you know, his complete blood count, um, importantly, is, is normal, so that we're not suspecting a hematologic cause. He has no toxicology um, abnormalities. His vitamins are all good, the folate's fine, and the HIV screen is negative. So remember with this question, we have multiple, multiple, multiple problems going on in the brain. And therefore, because we have this suspicion of multiple structural neurological abnormalities, we want to get a CT and an MRI of the brain. We really want to take a look at um, to see if we can find anything on these imaging modalities. And also a chest film um, because of some of his pulmonary uh, symptoms. So now let's take a look at uh, this chest x-ray. Here, let's go on. Uh, to these points, no focal consolidation or pleural effusion was seen. So all these lung markings look normal. Um, there's no uh, effusions noted, no consolidations, no evidence of pulmonary nodules or a pneumothorax. Pneumothorax is a collapse of the lung. So you'd see the absence of, of these cloudy lung markings. The cardiomediastinal silhouette was within normal limits. So the heart is not too large um, in that regard. And then Finally, there is an opacity right here, um, which suggested a mass pressing slightly against the surface of the trachea. So the trachea is coming down in the middle. Um, and then there's this opacity here that's slightly pressing against the trachea in the middle. Taking a look at this other orientation of his chest x-ray, there were some degenerative changes present in the lower thoracic spine, but otherwise, there are no um, abnormalities seen on that imaging. So no large lytic or blastic bony lesions. Okay, question three, taking a look at his brain, his brain imaging. Um, what are the four most likely causes of the multiple ring enhancing cystic masses seen on imaging of the patient's brain? So let's take a look at this uh, image of this patient's brain, you see these multiple, sorry, this isn't the best quality, but um, we do see these ring enhancing lesions. So there are four um, possible causes of uh, multiple ring enhancing lesions in the brain. So this might be a blast from the past from um, infectious disease, but uh, here, the correct answers are a bacterial abscess and indeed infections are their primary consideration for ring enhancing lesions, especially in immunocompromised patients, such as patients with um, HIV and when their uh, uh, T cell counts are super low. Also glioblastoma multiforme, a malignant tumor, primary malignant tumor in the brain, um, metastatic cancer. And from the title of the talk, you can probably guess that something 
along these lines might be going on in this patient. And then toxoplasmosis is, a, is an infectious agent that can, uh, or an infectious entity that can in, cause ring enhancing lesions in the brain. So let's take a look at the clinical course going on with this patient. He remains afebrile, so that makes us not think it's uh, an infection. His blood, urine, and sputum cultures did not show any growth. Um, and a transthoracic echo revealed no cardiac valvular anomalies or vegetation. So his heart seems to be working fine and there's no vegetations indicating any sort of um, valvular infection. But then, given the presence of multiple lesions in the brain parenchyma and the leptomeninges, as we saw in the previous slide, the patient's age and the worsening pulmonary and neurological symptoms, tests for cancer were performed. So let's think about this. Which two of the following malignant conditions are most likely to metastasize to the brain? And for us M2s, this is a really long time ago uh, when we learned about this, um, but uh, it's lung cancer and melanoma. These are the two that are most common. But now let me tell you that lung cancer accounts for 30 to 60% of all brain metastases. So lung is the dominant, is the dominant um, primary cancer that then has metastases to the brain. So among patients with cancer whose first presenting symptoms are neurologic like this patient, and then we find um, brain masses, more than half will eventually receive a diagnosis of lung cancer because um, brain metastases associated with lung cancer are so common. And then the incidence of brain metastases associated with small cell lung cancer in particular is such that 18% of patients with brain metastases at the time of diagnosis um, the incidence of brain mets in small cell lung cancer is 18% at the time of diagnosis, and then it approaches 80% within two years after diagnosis. So clearly brain metastases are quite common in lung, in lung cancer and especially in small cell lung cancer. So now let's take a look at some additional imaging. Uh, this is an abdominal scan. No hepatic masses were seen in the liver. The biliary tree was normal. However, remember we palpated that one centimeter uh, enlarged um, lymph node in the inguinal region. And indeed, on this image, we can see it. There's a large node here measuring 2.5 centimeters by 3.6 centimeters right around here. So that is an enlarged lymph node there. And then there's uh, an area of hypodensity measuring 2 to 2.3 centimeters in its largest dimension was detected in the spleen. And that's not shown on this scan. This is, a, this is at the level of the lungs, this scan. So a CT of the chest revealed a spiculated nodule in the lower lobe of the left lung here, um, by, indicated by the arrow, indicating the possibility of a primary bronchogenic or lung carcinoma. Um, and then finally, there was some mediastinal hyalur lymphadenopathy was also seen on CT, but not uh, shown in this particular um, slice of the CT. Okay, knowing what we know so far, what is the best diagnostic step for this patient? And to answer these sorts of questions, we need to think about the invasiveness and the risks of that treatment, but also what can, that, what, can that, um, what can that diagnostic procedure tell us? How informative is it going to be? So we need to weigh those two. And if we take a look at the answer, we want to look at that inguinal lymph node. We want to take a biopsy of that. So we could, we could take um, a lung biopsy or a brain, a, we could biopsy the brain with the, met, the metastases in the brain, or we could take a look at that um, speculated nodule in the lung. But as you can imagine, these procedures, uh, taking a biopsy of the brain would require craniotomy, that is removing a portion of the skull 
and going in and getting the material from the metastases in the brain. And then the lung biopsy would require thoracic surgery. Um, so that wouldn't be um, a good idea, especially when we have a, an enlarged lymph node that's much more easy to access. So just to read this uh, explanation, the, the patient has multiple ring enhancing lesions in the brain. We saw those. He has a mass in the lung and he has multiple areas of, of lymphadenopathy in the chest, abdomen, and pelvis. So all of these clues are leading us um, to a high probability of a malignant metastatic disease. And then obtaining a tissue specimen for histopathological analysis is really critical uh, for the diagnosis of cancer. We need to take a look at what these cells look like, uh, what this tissue looks like under the microscope. And like I said, it's easiest to access from a surgical standpoint, from a biopsy standpoint, the needle going in, uh, the inguinal lymph nodes are pretty easy to access. Okay, so now this is for us M2s. This is from the respiratory unit. Um, so we're looking at these dense, disorganized infiltrate. By the way, this is the biopsy of the inguinal lymph nodes. So this is what his inguinal lymph node looks like. This is a dense, disorganized infiltrate of blue, purple, small, hint, hint, small cells with indistinct nucle nucleoli, active mitoses, dispersed chromatin that indeed was effacing the normal architecture of the lymph nodes. So the, these cells have totally, these are not normal. Um, this is not normally what a lymph node histological section would look like. So these cells are highly proliferative and destroying the normal architecture of, of his node, of his inguinal lymph nodes. Then they did some staining. And so these are some markers. Uh, KI67 is a marker, marker of cellular proliferation. So you can see that many, 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 many of these cells staining in brown, um, have, are staining positive for KI67, indicating that there is a lot of proliferation going on, actively going on with these cells. TTF1 is a, a gene transcription activity stain that's often seen in lung adenocarcinomas and small cell carcinomas. So this is a common stain that the pathologist will do when he or she suspects lung cancer. And then Lastly, chromogranin. We want a marker of neuroendocrine cell differentiation because small cell lung cancer is a neuroendocrine, is a neuroendocrine type of cancer. Okay, all of these tests, especially the histopathological se sections, are confirming the diagnosis of metastatic small cell lung cancer. I think this is the last question. What is the most appropriate first line treatment for this patient? Given the extent of his disease, um, meaning it's not just confined to the lungs. So what do you think is the best option? I'll give you a couple seconds. The correct answer is multi-agent chemotherapy. So uh, randomized controlled trials have shown that for the treatment of extensive stage small cell lung cancer, that is it's metastasized and spread to many different locations. Um, I think the dividing line is if it's affecting more than one side um, so it may be, it's not considered extensive if it's affecting the lung plus the hyalur lymph nodes on that one side. But if it goes beyond that, so our patient had metastases in his brain and is an end in his inguinal lymph nodes, at that point we call it extensive, extensive small cell lung cancer. So for this type of cancer, a multi-agent chemotherapy regimens provide a greater survival benefit than a, than a single agent chemotherapy. 
the reason for that is um, small cell lung cancers tend to, excuse me, tend to develop resistance pretty quickly to a single agent. So that's why we want two different medications with two different mechanisms of action. Um, a common regimen for these patients involves the combination of a platinum agent, so cisplatin or carboplatin, and a podophylox. Hmm, I've never heard of that. I suppose we'll learn about it soon, um, such as etoposide. Okay, our hemonc unit is coming up. <laughs> okay, now a couple facts about small cell lung cancer, abbreviated SCLC. It's an aggressive form of lung cancer that accounts for approximately 15% of all bronchogenic carcinomas. So in contrast with a non-small cell lung cancer, which are staged according to our traditional tumor node metastasis, TNM system, these small cell lung cancers are staged only in, in two stages, limited and extensive, and that was the um, if it crosses one side of the lung, if the cancer metastasizes to more than one side, then we consider it extensive. Um, like I alluded to before with our patient, um, the management of small cell lung cancer in the extensive stage is built around the use of systemic chemotherapy agents, and often more than one. Most of the time, standard of care is more than one. And there does not appear to be a recognized role for surgical remover, removal of the primary tumor in the management of extensive stage small cell lung carcinoma. So it, it, it doesn't make a difference. It doesn't, there doesn't appear to be a role to remove the primary nodule from the lung itself. But now, looking at the brain metastasis in particular in, in small cell lung cancer, this patient did undergo surgical removal of the brain metastases in the right occipital lobe and the right cerebellum. So we're trying to fix his visual field deficit by removing the mass in the, or masses in the right occipital lobe. And then as far as the, his gait problems, um, perhaps this uh, removal of masses in the right cerebellum could improve his gait problems. Um, then this patient, he was followed with, uh, after these surgeries, he underwent whole brain radiation for palliation and relief of severe neurological symptoms. So this is, an intended, is not intended to be a curative treatment, but more a, a palliative and uh, symptom relief treatment. And then because, um, or one fact is that there is incomplete penetration of the CNS associated with the use of chemotherapy. So that, that multi-agent chemotherapy regimen won't necessarily pass through the CNS. Therefore, um, standard of care after six, four to six cycles of chemo is to do a prophylactic cranial irradiation. So these patients get chemo, four to six cycles. Then they undergo this prophylactic cranial irradiation for patients with small cell lung cancer, even if they don't have visible brain lesions. Remember I was alluding to 80% of patients after two years of the diagnosis of small cell lung cancer, 80% of those people will have um, brain metastases. So it's, uh, we do this, standard of care is to do a prophylactic cranial irradiation to try to prevent those. Okay, getting back to our patient, how he was managed and his outcome. He had an advanced or an extensive stage of his disease. So he got the multi-agent chemotherapy with cisplatin and etoposide. He did have some palliative surgical debulking of the brain metastases and whole brain radiation treatment, like I said. He got some dexamethasone, which is a glucocorticoid, um, to reduce his or minimize his vasogenic edema and also reduce the uh, neurological adverse effects of residual brain, brain lesions. He had two cycles of chemotherapy, which did reduce the size of the lung mass. 
It did reduce the extent of inguinal and mediastinal lymph adenopathy, and it did decrease the size or the extent of those splenic lesions. So those are those lesions in the spleen. Unfortunately, though, he had continued worsening of his uh, neurological symptoms, including agitation and increased weakness. And uh, it's really terrible. He had uh, increased difficulty walking as his balance deteriorated. So after the third cycle of chemotherapy, he made a decision to discontinue his treatment and transition to hospice care. And sadly, he died seven months after his initial present presentation and after seven months after presentation and his diagnosis of small cell lung cancer. Teaching points uh, with this case, there's a lot in this case, there's a lot involved, and that's mainly due to the extensive nature of his disease. So he did have primarily a lung cancer. That was where the primary tumor was. But because it spread to all these various different places, he had several uh, associated symptoms. And so we'll take a look at those now. He had homonymous hemianopia. It's a visual field defect marked by the loss of half of the field of view on the same side in both eyes. It can be caused by a structural lesion in the brain posterior to the optic chiasm. If you remember the, the visual pathway, uh, from the retina, the, the optic nerves converge in the optic chiasm and then spread out to the uh, occipital lobes of the brain. So if you're posterior, if the lesion is posterior to that optic chiasm, you're going to get a homonymous hemianopia, as opposed to if it's anterior to the optic chiasm, you're going to get a, a, a bitemporal, I think it's called, um, hemianopia, where it's uh, either both in the middle or both in the, on the lateral parts of your field of view. And then one other point is that when there is a lesion in the visual cortex of the contralateral occipital lobe, so way in the back of the brain, when it's back there, the hemianopia is completely congruous. That is, it's completely identical. The visual field defect is completely identical um, on each side of the brain or on each side of the visual field when the lesion is in the cortex. So then reviewing the cerebellum um, behind the brainstem, it plays a central role in the regulation of physical coordination. And the way we test a patient's cerebellar function is to test their gait. And that can provide us clues um, as to the underlying pathological condition. Remember, there are different parts of the cerebellum too. So depending on if their extremities are more, have more cerebellar symptoms or if their trunk has more cerebr cerebellar symptoms, we can kind of pinpoint where in the cere cerebellum the lesion is. And then you remember these other tests of the cerebellum. They include the finger to nose and the heel to shin testing that is more coordination and fine movements, knowing where your limbs are. And then the last way to test the cerebellum are those rapid alternating movements. CT and MRI, these are imaging modalities. These are really useful in the differential diagnosis of patients with suspected structural lesions in the brain. So patients who are coming in with neurological deficits, it's really important to quickly get a CT or an MRI. Some conditions are more urgent or emergent than others. If a, per, if a patient has a hemorrhage, you really want to discover that quickly and treat it fast. So a CT or an MRI um, of the brain is really important to get right away. Um, now, when we do these um, imaging modalities, with the use of radio contrast material injected into the patient's bloodstream and then the contrast eventually rises up into their cerebral vasculature, cerebral vasculature. Um, these can help us identify ring enhancing lesions. Um, and these can be caused by infectious, neoplastic as in this case, demyelinating. Sometimes patients with multiple sclerosis will have 
ring enhancing lesions. And then there are also some vasculitides, vascular conditions that can cause ring enhancing lesions in the brain. And then we talked about which tumors commonly metastasize to the brain. Um, and as we learned in our neural block, most of the masses, most of the tumors you see in the brain are not primary brain tumors. Most of the time when you see a mass in the brain, when you see a tumor in the brain, it's not a primary brain tumor, it's coming from somewhere else. Um, so the types of cancer are most likely to metastasize are the lung cancer and melanoma, but far and away are the most, those two. And then sometimes breast cancer, renal cell carcinoma, and colorectal cancer will metastasize to the brain. In particular, small cell lung cancer is a lethal, a, a deadly, uh, poor prognosis type of cancer that arises from neuroendocrine cells and accounts for a, even though it's deadly, it does thankfully account for a minority of lung cancers and it is strongly associated with smoking. A couple more of these. Um, the majority of patients with small cell lung cancer present with metastatic disease. Remember that we do the prophylactic um, brain irradiation for patients after four to six cycles of chemo, of multiple, of multi-agent chemo. After those couple of cycles, we do the prophylactic brain irradiation because brain metastases are so common in this condition. Um, the two chemotherapeutic agents, cisplatin and etoposide, are common and they've been well studied. And I got ahead of myself, but this whole brain radiation or prophylactic cranial radiation is an important part of management. And then like we saw with our patient who died after seven months, um, overall survival is poor. Okay, that reaches the end of the case. I'd like to shout out the um, people who have helped me make this talk and who uh, support this talk. Uh, the Tufts chapter of the AANS, the American Association of Neurological Surgeons. Um, here's our leadership team. I'm the president, Bailey's on the call. Alfred is our treasurer. And then the Department of Neurosurgery at Tufts is very supportive of our activities. Um, uh, Dr. Riesenberger is our faculty mentor for our chapter of the AANS. Shane, it, or Dr. Burke is a fourth year uh, resident over at Tufts also a Tufts School of Medicine graduate um, from 2016. And he has been really instrumental and supportive in our, in our activities. And I'd like to thank him for that. Okay, that concludes my talk. Um, this was a case of homonymous hemianopia metastatic brain cancer. Unfortunately, the patient died. Uh, that doesn't always happen, thankfully. And um, here's some references. This is where we got the case from the New England Journal of Medicine. These are really terrific. Um, and the, of course, they're not just limited to, to um, neurological cases. There's a gazillion of them. And then I did use that one figure from first date. OK. Are there any questions um, before I go? Otherwise, thank you all very much. Thanks, Calvin. Thanks, Jacob. Got some. I have not been monitoring the chat. Mainly, it's people thanking me. <laughs> Vestibulocochlear is the cranial nerve eight. That's right. Okay.